morning and welcome to Cedardale. We're so pleased you've joined us once again. Here we are in the hot days of summer, but we are thinking about the great gift that the Lord has made in creating the earth, the heavens, the sun, the moon, and we are thankful for his provisions. And today I think Pastor Grant is going to talk a lot about reasons for us to be thankful and praising God. But before we let him come and illuminate us, we're going to read some scripture. So I have two scriptures today, Psalm 149 and Psalm 150. And I'm going to read the first six verses of each one. So let me begin here. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Let the godly ones exalt in glory and let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And then it says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And we do praise the Lord today. And now let's enjoy Pastor Grant's message today. Good morning. It's great to be with you today. And we have a lot to cover today. There's seven reasons to praise the Lord. That's the title of our summer series starting today. Uh, seven reasons to praise the Lord. And so I hope uh, you're ready with pen in hand and some paper because you might find you might need it because it's, there's a lot of good stuff here. Let's uh, open in prayer and then I'll be happy to launch into this wonderful, vibrant message today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you and praise you. And we give our hearts to you in thankfulness that for all you've done for us. So, Father, we pray that you would bless our hearts today in a wonderful way. And we ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes into your wonderful word to see things that maybe we haven't seen before. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. So welcome, whether you're from Ontario or parts of Canada or the world, we want to say thank you for joining us today. You are so uh, wonderfully welcome to join us, and we're very thankful that you are. God bless you. Uh, Psalm 22, verse 3 chimes into our topic today when it says, But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. And Psalm 100, verse 4 and 5 will say, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And Psalm 70, verse 4, will say, Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you, and let those who love your salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. Amen. What a great thing to be able to do, isn't it? To magnify the Lord our God. In Psalm 149, verses 1 and 2, I just want to highlight them again for you. Praise the Lord, or hallelujah is the Hebrew word there. Sing to the Lord a new song in his praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Amen. The kind of music we listen to says a lot about who we are. Why do we sing on Sundays? 
Why do we sing praise songs? Did you know that during the 16 and 17th centuries, the growth of the influence of the Psalms upon Christians was absolutely incredible? Until the 1500s, and this is an amazing fact I found, congregational singing had gone by the wayside in most churches. People went to church to listen to singing by professional choirs. Yes, that's correct. Not to join in the praises themselves. And when Martin Luther set off the Reformation in 1517, congregational singing was revived. It was said of Martin Luther that he did as much for the Reformation by his hymns as he did by his translation of the wonderful Bible. In fact, those words are actually inscribed on his tomb in Wittenberg, Germany. In all, Martin Luther wrote 36 hymns which were meant for congregational singing. And the best known of those hymns is A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. And it's found in our hymnal here at Serial Church, uh, hymn number 30. The Protestant reformer and those that were tortured, the hunted Huguenot, the persecuted, saw themselves in King David as he fled the mountains as a bird to the hills. Like David, they were betrayed by friends and family. Or like the early Christians, they were locked away in dark, damp dungeons from which death was their only escape and release. In the strength of the Psalms, martyrs went to the stake, mounted the scaffold, or endured the horrific rack. In the strength of the Psalms, men and women and even children were dragged to jail singing the Psalms all along the way. And as in the days of Paul and Silas, dungeons resounded with the praises of Almighty God, with words memorized from the Psalms. So I want to ask you a question today. How's your praise today? Do you feel your, your praise and worship of the Lord is old and worn out? Do you need some new life breathed into your worship? Maybe you need some new spiritual victories to celebrate so that you can rejoice with new songs, with joy to the living God, our Lord. Seven reasons to praise the Lord. In Psalm 149, the writer describes the nation of Israel in the middle of a major celebration. Apparently, they were celebrating some type of victory. The word salvation used here carries the idea of deliverance or victory. That's the exact word that's used in verse 4 of Psalm 149. What did the writer mean when he talked about salvation? Was he talking about the same kind of salvation talked about in the New Testament? No. The word salvation used here in Psalm 149 is the idea of being saved from an enemy. It's the idea of being saved in the middle of a battle. And the Israelites were celebrating a recent victory or a recent rescue in the midst of a battle. In other words, they were jubilant and glad over God's deliverance and his salvation. They were so wrapped up in victory and celebration and joy that they could not help celebrate the Lord's victories in their life. Brethren, there is nothing wrong with celebrating what the Lord has done in your life. And there is nothing wrong with rejoicing and the victories that he has given you. Praise or halal used also in Psalm 149 means to command, to applaud, and to magnify. For the Christian, praising God is an expression of worshiping and glorifying the Lord Almighty. When we praise God, we humble ourselves and center our attention on the Lord with heartfelt expressions of love and adoration and thanksgiving. Praising God is to be our way of life. Unfortunately, most people pray, think praise is something that's only done one time a week in a church somewhere. However, praise should be part of every believer's lifestyle, part of his or her daily prayer life, and at work, in the car, at home, and even verse 5 in our wonderful Psalm 49 will say, even in bed, just about anywhere, you should be able to praise God. When we worship and praise God, we are focusing on God, who has the power and the majesty and the desire to deliver us from fear and oppression and even depression. The backdrop of Psalm 149 was possibly written after a significant battle, 
where the Israelites saw a great and mighty victory over an enemy as God stepped in and secured their success on the battlefield, or they had just returned home after the long captivity in Babylon. Either way, they had seen God redeem and deliver. So the psalmist declares, praise the Lord, in verses 1 and 9 of Psalm 149. They had seen a new mercy and a new deliverance. And so they celebrated a new song, a new praise to God. The nation of Israel was in the midst of a celebration. God had saved them from an enemy. To Israel, God's deliverance meant that they had a new chapter in the life of the nation to reestablish, rebuild, and rejoice. No longer were they under the domination and rule of a foreign king. They had come home to safety under the protection and rule of God himself. They rejoiced because of their redemption and restoration. God moved upon the writer of this psalm to tell them to forget their past hurts, troubles, and problems, and to begin to dwell upon the favor that God was going to show them. Worship must be in community, not simply individual. Worship must take place in a gathered fellowship. It is not just an individual performance. It's not just personal feelings. It's not just private experience. Worship is corporate, social, and in community, in the assembly of the faithful. His praise is in the assembly of the faithful, and we must always be reminded about that. Let Israel be glad in its maker, and let the children rejoice in their king. In the assembly of the faithful, in the gathered community, even in the congregation of the saints, as verse 1 will tell us. When we come together to worship and souls gather around us, we find that God's Holy Spirit does something in the whole of us that is greater than what he does in each of us personally. God has a way of working through his gathered people. Worship requires our presence before God and before one another. First, here's the first of the seven. We are called to praise and worship God. It's God and his son, Jesus Christ, who alone are worthy of humanity's praise. And with the multitudes in heaven, we will sing to the glorious one who is worthy of all praise, Revelation 5. We, the people of God, yes, we are called to praise and worship God in Psalm 150, verse 6. We should be praising him with a joyous ode as the psalmist did many years ago. The act of praise is something that's for every living, breathing person. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, it says in Psalm 40, verse 16. Did you know that the Bible actually commands it? The Bible is clear in telling us that if we're saved, we should make a joyful noise to the Lord. Psalm 100, Psalm 98, yes, and there's many others. Almighty God is worthy of our praise and worship. Psalm 18, praise him because he is God and he is worthy. Praise him for the battles he's already fought for you and won. Praise him because he has a perfect plan to give you victory and glorify himself through it all. Praise is an expression of faith. It declares that we believe that God is with us and is in control of the outcome of all our circumstances. Praise is a sacrifice, something that we offer to God, not just because we feel like it, but because we believe in him, we love him, and we believe that he's actually worthy of our praise. Second, praise facilitates access to God. Praise and worship utter in the presence of God. Psalm 22, verse 3. And praise reveals our devotion to God. When we praise the Lord, we are declaring our devotion and allegiance to him. As God's children, praise is one way we reveal our identity and connection with our Heavenly Father. God inhabits the praises of his people. When we praise and worship him, the presence of God will fill every situation that we are facing, and we will experience victory in battles. Some think that worship is a response after the Holy Spirit moves on them, but it's actually the other way around. The Holy Spirit moves when we praise and worship. Lifting up Jesus Christ through praise and worship invokes the Lord's presence and power to flow in our midst. 
This is why we begin our services with praise and worship songs here at City Hill Church in Perfala. Praise elevates us into God's presence. Paul and Silas knew how to lift their hearts above the troubles and enter into God's presence and power. Through praise and worship, their hearts were raised into the joyous presence and peace of God, which allowed his power to operate in their situation. Uh, just turn to Acts 16 for that. God takes pleasure in you, and he takes pleasure and delight in me. And so when we come to church, we will praise him in song and celebrate the very fact that he loves us. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is my delight. Psalm 16, verse 3. Brethren, we are the benefactors of the Lord's delight and his good, good pleasure. There is no part of his people's interests that he doesn't consider. What that means is that there is nothing about your welfare and well-being that isn't important to him. Praise him and thank him that he delights in you. Third, praise is where God lives. Now, a lot of people don't realize that, but it's true. In Revelation 5, 9, it says, And they sang a new song. In Revelation 14, 3, And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. In both these chapters... We hear new songs being sung in all of heaven in praise of Jesus. The fact is that there has been more songs sung in praise of Jesus than any other person in all of history. In all of eternity, the angelic songwriters will be busy coming up with new ones. For our praise of him will never, ever, ever cease or stop. Eternity will never cease it. It's tireless praise for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who is the Alpha and the Omega. Fourth, praise motivates us to holy living. Now this was a new one, but it's very good. Listen to this. Praise motivates us to holy living. Praise demands that we open ourselves and our hearts to God, which often reveals the clutter that has displaced his presence in our lives. Often, praise Demands are confessing pride and sin. Praise is a purging and purifying agent. It cleanses the soul. The more we praise and worship the Lord, the more we desire and long to be like him. The Bible is actually filled with new things. And one of the most common references is the reference to new songs that we can sing and praise to God. Not only does our text say, sing unto the Lord a new song, in Psalm 149, 1, but this theme is repeated over and over and over so that it becomes a major duty of believers to be ever involved with the new. Praise produces or facilitates productivity. Whatever you do, praising God will make you do it better. Praise God at work and you will enjoy your work better and even tolerate it better. <laughs> Praise God in your home and you will have a better home life. Praise God as you drive, and you will find that it won't be the torture that it, it can be with gridlock and spastic drivers cutting you off. Praising God is the most practical activity there is, for it is the source of your strength. Exodus 15, 2. Fifth, praise chases away despair. Praise increases our joy. Joy is contagious. In Romans 14, Paul tells us that the kingdom of God is not about living in fear, but the joy of a pleasing relationship with God fueled by the Holy Spirit. He takes pleasure in our worship and our service to him. And we are not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. Psalm 52 talks about two kinds of praises. Those who praise themselves and boast of their evil, and they end in everlasting ruin. The others are the praises of God. They go, will go on flourishing in the house of God, praising him forever. Praise is the weapon that overcomes the forces that pull us away from God, especially pride. The praises of God conquer pride and avoid the fall it leads to. Praise is a weapon of victory. But let it get rusty and you are bound to be wounded by one of the many foes of the Christian life. Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength, can also mean the lack of your joy is your weakness. When you are not in a spirit of joyful praise, 
you are vulnerable to enemy attack. Praise keeps us power oriented, but lack of praise leads us to be problem oriented. When we do nothing but focus on problems, we tend to be led downward to pessimism and discouragement. There are going to be times when the mood of worship is somber and subdued. There is a time to mourn and a time for quiet. Even so, the bottom line is joy. There is one non-negotiable, one truth never to be sacrificed, and that is that God loves us. God cares for us. And the Lord takes pleasure in his people. No matter how we say it, the bottom line is joy. Because God is in the business of lifting us up out of the miry clay and setting our feet on a rock. For that there is no substitute. He adorns the humble with victory. Look up verse 4 in Psalm 149. So, how do we worship? I don't care whether you say it with a shout or with a whisper. Whether you sing it with the majesty of Bach or the exuberance of a Chris Tomlin. But sing glory, sing salvation, sing God loves us, sing Jesus loves me. Look at verse 4, which says, For the Lord takes delight or pleasure in his people. He crowns or beautifies the humble with salvation. No titles, no money, no reward, no promotion, no public recognition can ever compare to this. Our reward in this life is to know that God delights in us and we have been beautified, beautified with Jesus. Please hear me on that from verse 4 of our text. If God is happy with you because you are happy with him, you are on the highest level of happiness possible. Spurgeon said, The thought of the Lord's taking pleasure in us is a mine of joy never to be exhausted. Then the psalmist said, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Six, praise is an effective weapon against Satan, because Satan hates and despises praise. In Dostoevsky's book, The Brothers Komarov, Ivan imagines he sees the devil, and a conversation takes place in which the devil says, if I could praise God, I would cease to be the devil. Think about that. That's actually a very powerful thought. Praise puts God on your side because you are on God's side. Did you know that when Israel lost a battle, it was because they had ceased to praise God? Also, the power of praise kept the demons at bay from King Saul, who was otherwise under their control. By praise, we bind the enemy. Look at verse 8 of 149. It speaks of binding their kings and nobles. By our praise, we bind the powers of Satan. Believe me, we are no match for the unseen forces of Satan. He has so many advantages over us. But we do have one weapon that negates all his advantages. And that is the weapon of praise. Warren Wiersbe once said, We have neglected our greatest weapon for overthrowing empires, and we are content to do so. Please don't be. Don't ever be content with doing nothing. Praise defeats our enemy and grants us victory through divine interventions, and our praise puts evil to flight. One of the greatest examples in the Old Testament is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. A vast army of Moabites and Ammonites came against Israel. When King Jehoshaphat was told of it, he went to prayer. In verse 12 we read, O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast enemy that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. God promised to be with them. And so in verse 19, we read that the Levites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And as they marched to war, verse 21 says that King Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness and as they went out the head of the army, they were saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. And as they marched into battle singing, the Lord gave them the victory over this far superior enemy. It was such a total victory that they called the place the Valley of Baccarat, which means the Valley of Praise. Can you imagine? They went there to praise God, 
and then went back to the temple in Jerusalem to praise him from, from harp and lutes and trumpets. And from then on, King Jehoshaphat had peace on all sides. When we praise and worship the Lord, the Lord will cause confusion in the amp of our enemies and make them destroy themselves. When God's people begins to praise his name, it sends the demons running and it releases the power and might of God on our behalf. What was the secret weapon that gave them victory over a superior foe? It was praise. This made them superior for praise is a weapon far more powerful than the weapons made by man. We praise, we sing, because our King of Kings has broken the yoke of bondage from every oppressor. When he set me free, he didn't leave me under the rule of Satan or sin. He broke the bonds of prison for me. Glory to God, he has set me free. Amen. Seventh, this is the best one. If They're all good though. He is worthy of it. He is worthy of it. The Lord is great and worthy of our praise. Almighty God is worthy of praise and worship. Psalm 18. The psalmist is not addressing himself to a foreign nation. Rather, he is attempting to motivate God's people to rejoice in and celebrate what the King of Heaven has done for them. For he is worthy, period. Praise him because he is God and he is worthy. Praise him for the battles he's already fought for you and won. Praise him because he has a perfect plan to give you victory and glorify himself this time too. Praise is an expression of faith. It declares that we believe God is with us and he is in control of the outcome of all our circumstances. Praise is a form of prayer for it is not just horizontal, it is vertical as well. We praise because we have a wise and glorious king and he is the king of kings. In conclusion, in Psalm 149, David gave this call to worship. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praises in the assembly of the faithful. Now, I know what many of us are guilty of. Rather than making a new song, we make a new complaint. We utter a new bellyache. We grumble rather than celebrate all that God has done for us. If we are not careful, what happens is that we begin to thrive on being negative, critical, and complaining. Let's be honest about it. Too often we grumble. We complain about this. We complain about that. We even grumble about the stuff at church, which is his bride. Please hear me on that. And God forbid we grumble to Christ about his beautiful bride that he died and bled for. In this life, there are far too many doomsayers waiting to point out how bad life can be. For a believer in Christ, complaining and grumbling are wrong. Beloved, the Christian life is no place for complaining. The Christian life is no place for being negative. The Christian life is no place for anger. Those types of attitudes don't belong to us. The believer's heart must be a place of praise and celebration. Our heart must be a place of joy, adoration, and a sanctuary of praise. If you are celebrating what the Lord has done for you in and in you, don't be discouraged by those who want to stop you. Why? Because if there is anyone in this whole wide world who has a right to celebrate, praise, and rejoice, it's a Christian. The church must be jubilant and must be a celebrating church. The church of Jesus Christ must be a church that is rejoicing and praising and singing a new song. Well, what do we have to sing about? Pastor Grant, what do we have to sing about? I am going to take you back to verse 4 of Psalm 149. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people, and he will beautify the meek with salvation. If we need a reason to sing, if we need a reason to praise, if we need a reason to celebrate, here it is. God takes pleasure in us. Let me say that again. God takes pleasure in us. God takes pleasure in you and in me. So when I come to church, I come to praise him. I come to sing. I come to celebrate. I come to give to him. I come jubilant because the Lord loves me and takes pleasure in me. So brethren, are you jubilant and celebrating? 
It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips, said the psalmist in Psalm 34, verse 1. Praise God in difficult situations. God will go ahead of you and cause a breakthrough for you. When we praise God, it takes the focus off our problem, off our weakness, and off our issues and inadequacies. When we praise God, we place our focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, from whom our help comes. In 2 Chronicles 20, 21, King Jehoshaphat appointed singers unto the Lord. What does this show? What does this show? It shows that God is the focus, not man. Please hear me on this. God is the focus, not man. Psalm 22 says, God inhabits praise. God thrives in an atmosphere of praise. Psalm 16 tells us that when the presence of God comes down, there is fullness of joy. When we praise God, he descends. The atmosphere changes. Second Chronicles chapter 5. He performs miracles, signs, and wonders. Exodus 15. When we praise God, curses are broken and blessings follow. When we praise God, it makes God move on behalf of you. The praise giver praise energizes God and makes him silence all your enemies. When we praise God, you experience deliverance from every chain that is holding you back. Because God descends into the arena praise is coming from. God is still the glorious one who answered King Jehoshaphat, who answered Paul and Silas. And when they trusted him and praised him in the moment of their great need, he delivered them. And he can do it for you today, my friend. Brethren, if you've been guilty of singing a wrong song or if you're singing songs which magnify your troubles and your woes, Please remember that as children of the Most High, He has given you and I a new song. So we should always praise Him. Let the praise continue and never stop. Amen. Oh, praise Him today, brethren. Praise Him and stay with it. Let's pray. God bless you. Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity we've had to hear the instruction of your word, your living word to our hearts. May you strike a chord in our heart and may our tongue be ready to sing praises to you even today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.